tonight, Romans 4. Romans 4. Now, I don't know about y'all, but this Roman, this Romans, this book of Romans has, has been rocking your boy. Like, for real, it's, it's been challenging me in certain areas of my life. Um, some of my beliefs, some of the things that I've learned throughout the years. I grew up in church, so I knew church, but I didn't know Jesus. I knew sin, but I didn't know Jesus. So my responsibility with what God has called me to do is to spread the good news. God told me, man, my people know sin more than they know me. And I don't think we know the difference. I think we, we've we been preached sin so much. What's up, Natalie? Good to see you. We've been preached sin so much to where we wear sin glasses. What do I mean when I see that? When I say that? When I say that we wear sin glasses. What's up, Curly? That means that the lens that we view people through is sin-based. How we view ourselves is sin based. That's why we always beat ourselves up when we drop the when we drop the ball, or if we have a struggle, we beat ourselves up almost to the point where it causes us to separate from God and to run away from God because we're we're shame of our sins, we're shame of our short shortcomings. So God told me my people have been focusing on sin too much. They know sin more than they know me. They know what the word says about alcohol, zodiac signs, um, don't do this, don't do that. But they don't know me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put y'all on game with, I'm going to teach y'all more about Jesus than sin. Because we know enough about sin. We grew up knowing sin. Don't smoke, don't drink, don't hang out with these people, don't get no tattoos, none of that. But knowing all that stuff is not teaching you about Jesus. It's not, to it's not teaching you about the righteousness, how your righteousness and your salvation that God has given to you as a gift. I know it's too good to be true. That's the name of this series. It's too good to be true. The salvation and what Christ did for us is too good to be true. And that's what we're going to talk about in Romans 4. We've been, we've been going in on Romans and I've been learning as I've been going through the text to present the word to you. So I don't want y'all to think that this is one-sided. I don't want y'all to think that y'all are the only people that's learning. Like while I'm speaking to you, I'm learning myself. So Romans 4, one of my favorite characters in the Bible uh, that God often speaks to me um, is Abraham. Abraham is back in Genesis. Abraham is the patriarch of our faith. The biggest thing that sticks out to me about Abraham is Abraham had a son when he was 99. Yeah. Abraham had a son when he was 99. And his wife was old too, Sarah. But God made a promise to him when he was 75 and say, hey, I'm going to give you a son. And so Abraham was like, man, I'm too old to have a son. Like my, my stuff don't even work no more. Not only does my stuff not work because we didn't have by it. They didn't have by Algra. They didn't have all that other stuff that y'all be taking. They didn't have that back in the day, in, in the Bible days. So when your body stopped working, it just stopped working. And as you get older, as a man, uh, it, I don't know how many men on here, it just don't do what it do like it used to do. It, it just, I mean, it's just, it's just how, how it is. I mean, I don't know why God set it up to where, yeah, I would think that if, when the man body stopped working, the, the women body should stop working at a certain age, but no, it just don't, it just don't work like that. So Abraham body couldn't even work to even have a child. So when God told him this, Abraham was like, I don't know about that, God. But Abraham believed God and God gave him a son at a very, very old age. And his wife was barren. So his wife was barren and your body don't work, plus you old. 
but Abraham believed God. So that's who we're going to talk about tonight. But before we jump into Romans 4, I want to give us context to where, where we left off Wednesday. And that was Paul talking to the religious Jays. There's a particular group of people that I'm not going to say their name. I'm just going to say the first letter of their name so I don't get put in jail again. So if you go back to Romans 3, we're going to, re we're going to read the last two verses. Romans 3.30 says, there is only one God, and he makes people right with him only by faith, whether J's or whether they are G's. So a lot of times in our culture, we are being taught or we have different denominations out here and different type of uh, religions that say these particular people, only, only they are God's chosen people. Or your skin color, this color, then God is, the, you're God's chosen people because of your skin color. That's not Bible. Right here in Romans 3.30, it says God makes his people right, whether you are J or whether you are Jew. Whether your skin color, this color, it don't matter about your skin color. That's what we talked about last time. But some people, even back then, was trying to make it out to be a race thing. So Romans 4 Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. And what did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now, that's too good to be true. Because that's not what they taught me at Africa Baptist Church. No, that's not, I, that's not what they taught me at Evening Star Baptist Church. That's not what they taught me at the Lion's Cross. Those are the three churches that I went to that, that, that taught me that I had to work for my salvation. I know ain't nobody on here for Africa, so I can say their names. Africa Baptist Church. They said, son, you join the church, you got to be baptized. And you can't listen to this. You can't wear this. You can't go over here. You got to look like this. You got to go to church every Sunday. You need to come to Bible study. You need to go to Bible school, vacation Bible school, all that. Even the Star Missionary Church taught, taught me the same thing. Now at the Lion's Cross, they said, no, nah, bro, you got to do that. Plus, you got to speak in tongues and you got to be baptized in the name of Jesus. I know you've been baptized before, but if you weren't baptized in the name of Jesus and you was only baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, then you ain't saved. That's how I grew up. But I don't know how we get these type of beliefs when the Bible strictly speaks against stuff like this. I mean, there's a whole lot of places in the Bible that speaks against us working for our righteousness and our salvation. Right here, it says Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous. What is righteous? Right standing with God. And we're going to talk about like what Abraham had to do or not do in order to be considered righteous before the Lord. Now, verse 2 says, if his good deeds had made him acceptable to God. Now, in good deeds, you can throw anything in there that you want to. You can throw communion. You can, you can throw honoring the Sabbath, baptism, going to church, not getting tattoos, don't have no piercings, uh, Easter, Pentecost, all those good deeds. If those made him acceptable God, acceptable to God, he would have something to boast about. That's not God's way. So back in the Old Testament, when God appealed to Abraham, he said, Hey, bro, I need for you to leave your hometown. I need for you to leave the homeland. So Abraham left. 
Abraham was hearing from God like no other person on earth during this time. Abraham rescued his nephew out of some disobedience. Sodom and Gomorrah. Everybody know that story. Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, Abram got his nephew out of that. Not only that, I told you that God promised Abraham a son. But right after God blessed him with his son named Isaac, God asked for Isaac back. Now, I'm not talking about when Isaac was born that they took him to the front of the church and said, God, I, I give my son to you. I give my baby to you. No, God wanted Abraham to sacrifice his son. I'm talking about Abraham had a knife. Laid the promise, the promise, the son laid it on the altar. And right before he was about to stab his son, there was a ram in the bush and, the, and an angel appeared to Abraham and says, Abraham, Abraham, don't do it. So I want to ask you, whatever, whatever the promise that God has given you, whatever the vision, whatever the dream that God has given you, are you willing to sacrifice it? Because God is going to put you in a test to see whether you love the gift more than you love him. Now, you may, it may not be your children, but it may be that job that, you have been, that you've been praying for. It could be that husband. It could be that wife. It could be that house. It could be whatever. Are you willing to sacrifice that if God asks you to? Now, what does that mean? That means that you give it to God and say, God, I can't fix it. I can't fix my husband. I can't fix my wife. I give them to you. I can't fix my son. I can't fix my sister. I give them to you. Are you willing to take your hands off of a situation that you cannot fix and give it to God? Don't even touch it. Don't call. Don't text. Don't follow. Don't do nothing. Just give it completely to God. And I know you love it. Whatever it is, I know you love it. But can you take your hands off of it? But the boasting part that verse 2 talks about. I think in today's culture, due to social media, sometimes as Christians, we can get kind of boastful. Especially when we don't view God right. A lot of us. We like showing off because we got saved uh, earlier this year and we we hadn't missed a Sunday. I've been on all of TikTok, uh, Reggie TikTok lives. Um, I speak in tongues every day. I do this. I do that. I've been on a social media fast, that part. See, a lot of us, sometimes we want to get to glory, want to get the glory instead of giving God the glory. What does that look like? Because right here it says in verse two. Abraham would have had something to boast about. So when you go, I use this for an example. When you're about to take yourself off social media, you're on a social media fast. Do you announce it to everyone? We're in Romans 4. When you put yourself on a social media fast, do you... Do you announce to everybody, hey, I'm going on a social media fast? I see people all the time. I, I, I watch your page now. I will check your page out to see if you about that life for real. They'll say, hey, I'm logging off of social media. It's too much. God told me to get off social media, and I promise you. Over 50% of the time, within 24 hours, them jokers back on there. Like, bro, I thought you was getting off social media. How you back on here? See, you trying to show off. I promise you. They'll say, hey, I'm getting off social media. You may not even announce it, but you jump in my inbox and I help you out. You say, oh, yeah, God told me to get off social media. I'm getting off social media. And I look back and you took a selfie. Within eight hours, like, bro, what is you doing? I thought you said you was getting off social media. You're trying to show off. Or sometimes, I'm not going to say that. Thank you, Holy Girls. 
Sometimes us, uh, we brag about being abstinent. We go let the world know it's been 478 days since we had relations with somebody. Don't nobody, don't know, don't nobody, don't nobody care. Like, I don't really care. Like, I mean, if it comes up in conversation, we can tell each other, but you don't have to be bragging on social media because you went 478 days without having relations with someone. Great, but that don't make you no more saved than the dope boy. It, so? So we got to watch that we don't be bragging on social media. Don't nobody care nothing about because you don't drink no more. Okay, fine. If it comes up in conversation, okay, nah, I'm good. I don't, I don't want none of that. But you don't have to get on social media and brag that you don't drink. Great. But that don't make you holier than nobody else because you don't drink. This is another one where we brag about. This is another area that we brag about as Christians. Oh, I hear the Lord saying, we'll start our look, whatever we're saying, we'll start off. I hear the Lord saying to pray. I hear the Lord saying, ooh, I got a word for so-and-so, so-and-so. Like we, like, Sometimes we really be trying to sh be trying to flex like don't nobody else hear from God. I had a recent phone call a couple months ago and they came, they called me and they was like, oh, I got a word for the Lord for you. I'm like, OK, because where I am now, I'm not really impressed by, OK, you got a word for, for me. OK, I got my, my friend. So if he want to tell me something, he'll tell me. I'm not saying he can't tell you, but don't think that I'm going to think higher or, or put you on a pedestal just because you hear from God. That ain't, I mean, that's the bare minimum. But you have to watch people like this who flex on social media think that they're the only people who hear from God. If you're a son or daughter of the living God, you can hear from him just like the prophets can, just like the evangelists can, just like Reggie can, just like anybody else can. So be careful about people who try to brag and make you make you seem like you less than because you don't hear from God like that. Sometimes we be flexing on social media. And I'm not saying all the time. I'm just saying sometimes because we want people to look at us through a certain lens to make us seem like we're higher than everyone else. I also should ask you this question. So do we think someone bragging because they are Showing how God blessed them on social media. Do you think somebody bragging because they they, sh they showed off the car that they bought or the house that they bought or the trip that they took? Is that bragging all the time? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Because sometimes you can show your stuff off to show other people like, hey, God blessing me just like he blessing you and you don't even serve him. But see, a lot of times within the kingdom, we were brought up that if you truly love God, you got to be broke. Yeah, I was brought up to where um, it was implied or almost taught that just because you love God, you got to be broke. Mm -mm. Get somebody else to do it. Uh-uh, I can love God and have money just like the scammer, just like the dope boy, just like anybody else that's doing stuff that's not living for him. So we'll get mad at T.D. Jakes for having a private jet, but we don't say nothing about Jay-Z having a private jet. Make it make sense. So Jay-Z can have a private jet, but T.D. Jakes can't. But because we're... We're religionized. We think T.D. T. D. Jakes or some other prominent Christian leader doing something wrong because they got big bread. Abraham had big bread. So let's get out of this mentality like we got to be living paycheck to paycheck. No, God will increase your bank account when you start living for him. He will give you a nice car, a nice house. Why? Because when I witness to people, and they say, oh, bro, where you get that car from? How long you been had that car? 
See, now that's a conversation piece for me to share the gospel with them. Hey, bro, let me tell you, man. Man, God's so good, bro. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, God blessing me, man. He blessing me in all areas of my life, but he's blessing me financially. So sometimes when we see certain people doing stuff on social media, it's not that they're boasting. It's just they're letting their light shine and showing others how Jesus blesses his, his sons and his daughters. This is another common trend on social media where people record when they're actually giving people money or helping the homeless or helping the less fortunate. Is that bragging? When I see stuff like that, I don't think bragging. It don't matter what their, it don't matter what their motive is. To me, it don't. Because there's so much other stuff on social media. So even though they're showing off giving to the people, now I'm not saying record some homeless person or, not, or anything like that. But if you're giving a waitress or a waiter a thousand dollar tip, I don't think there's nothing wrong with showing that on social media. Because you may be bragging, but you're also showing people what love looks like. So it don't necessarily matter what your motive is. It's still showing love. You get what I'm saying? So I'm not. So what I'm saying is don't always think somebody bragging. Because I feel like if Jesus was in the modern day, I think Jesus would be showing some of his miracles on social media. I think Jesus may be healing some people on social media. Will we say Jesus bragging? Something to think about. Let me get back to the text. Ooh, I got to hurry up. Y'all ain't praying hard enough. So, so verse three is saying, okay, Abraham did all these things, but it's nothing to brag about. For the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God and counted him as righteous because of his faith. Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God when God told him to leave his hometown. Abraham believed God when he told him he was going to give him a son even though he was 75. So let's go to Genesis 12 right quick. I got to hurry this up. Doing too much talking. Help me, Holy Spirit. Genesis 12. Genesis 12, 1 through 4. The Lord said to Abram, at this point, his name is Abram. Leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed him. Abraham just didn't shout. Abraham just didn't post on social media. Abraham just didn't clap. It says Abraham departed. Which means true faith is not only shown by your mouth, through your mouth, but through your feet. True faith is shown not only through your mouth, but through your feet. See, Abraham, when God, gave, when God gave the instructions to Abraham, Abram, he moved. It says, verse 4, so Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed him. When God gives you a word, when God gives you a vision, do you do more than just talk about it? Do you actually do what God told you to do? You keep saying you believe God, but you ain't doing nothing to show him that you believe him. Abraham departed. So basically, God is saying, move. If you believe me, prove it. Okay, you said the prayer of salvation. You took Jesus, you received Jesus into your life, and you believe in your heart that he died for your sins and he rose on the third day. Okay, I'm not saying you're going to change overnight. But what are you doing after you said that prayer? Or did you just go right back to doing what you was doing before you said that prayer? 
So you say you believe that God died for you. You say it, but are you moving accordingly? I'm not saying be perfect. I'm saying if you were sleeping with this certain individual and you said the prayer of salvation and y'all weren't married and all that stuff, like, are you trying to position yourself not to get caught up in that same habit? Not that, not saying that you won't do it again, but are you trying to say, man, I, I can't do this no more? Do you have some type of conviction? So faith is not only shown through what you say, but how you move. Verse 4, Romans 4, 4. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Oh, what joy for those whose obedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those who re whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. That's too good to be true. That's too good to be true. So you saying by faith. My disobedience is forgiven. That's what verse seven says. So through faith, my sins are put out of, out of sight. That means God don't even see them anymore. So through faith, my record is cleared of sin. That's what you're telling me, Reg. I'm not telling you that. That's what Paul's saying. That's too, it, that's too good to be true. I know it. I know it. I know it. When you don't believe like this, you beat yourself up for not being perfect. When you, when you don't believe this, you beat yourself up for not being perfect. And that's not from God. We have to get to where we understand that our righteousness and salvation is found in Jesus and stop making it so much about you. This ain't about you. This is about Jesus. So let me ask you this. If one man's sin got us under a curse, Adam, we got so many memes about Adam. If Adam, would have, if Adam and Eve wouldn't have done this, we wouldn't be experiencing this. If Adam and Eve wouldn't have ate of the forbidden fruit, we wouldn't be going through this. So if, if Adam, his one act can put us under sin, why we don't allow Jesus' act to set us free? Why? Why we give more credit to Adam and Eve than we do to Jesus Christ? We didn't do nothing to deserve the curse that we're under from Adam and Eve. But we give them credit and say, oh, we all born in the sin. Oh, this sin is in my flesh because Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. But then Jesus reverse it and we don't give Jesus credit. <laughs> One act ha has us under a curse, but one act also saved us. Why we don't give Jesus credit? Verse 9. Now, is this blessing only for Jays or is it for uncircumcised Gs? Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. But how did this happen? Was he counted as righteous only after he was circumcised? Or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. Now, if you weren't on this live last time, we talked about circumcision. So what I'm going to do is explain to you what circumcision was, is. When God made a covenant with Abraham, the sign of the covenant was circumcision. So in Genesis 17, 9 through 14, God said to Abraham, your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. 
This is the covenant that you and your descendants must, must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. You must cut off the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between me and you. From generation to generation, every male child must be circumcised on the eighth day. This applies not only to members of your family, but also to the servants born in your household and the foreign born servants whom you have purchased. All must be circumcised. Your bodies will bear the mark of the everlasting covenant. So this is part of the Israelite culture, circumcision, which is a representation of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Circumcision is old covenant. Right. We don't practice circum. We practice circumcision over here, but it don't have nothing to do with our faith or our belief. So back in the Old Testament, in order for you to become a J, some people were saying was telling the gen the Gentiles that you got to be circumcised first, bro. bro. You got to be circumcised before you saved. If you're not circumcised, that means you're not saved. That's old covenant though. What Jesus, what Paul is telling the people that the circumcision, the salvation, the righteousness that Abraham had, had nothing to do with his circumcision because God counted him righteous before he was circumcised. So that means that Abraham, I want you to get circumcised. But that's not where your salvation lies. Okay, we don't practice circumcision over here, Reggie. What are you talking about? What I'm saying is, okay, God may want you to get baptized. He's just saying your salvation don't lie in your baptism. So if you want to get baptized, go ahead. But that's not where your salvation lies. Meaning, if, you, if I count you as righteous and you don't get baptized, you still saved. If I count you as righteous and you don't get circumcised, you still saved. What I'm saying is, if I see you and count you as righteous just because you don't speak in tongues, you still saved whether you speak in tongues or not. That's what this text is saying. God counted Abraham righteous even before the circumcision. The circumcision had nothing to do with his righteousness or his salvation. But it's, it's, it's my... It's funny to me that this circumcision in Genesis is old covenant, right? It's old covenant. It's part of the law of Moses, but you never hear people talk about it. They'll bring up the Levitical laws about tattoos, the Levitical laws about certain food, but they don't bring up the, the Levitical law about circumcision. Why? Because we are no longer under the covenant, the old covenant. So I made a post yesterday. I don't know if you heard. I made a post about idolatry. I made a post about zodiacs, alcohol. You should have saw how the Christians, y'all probably didn't see it, but my inbox was jumping from Christians saying, oh, in, in Leviticus, in Leviticus, in Leviticus, it say uh, zodiacs are a sin. But I'm like this. We're not. We're, you can't. You you can't use that. You can't look. You can't use the law of Moses. We're no longer under the old covenant. Cause guess what? If you use the law talking about zodiac signs, you got to use the law for circumcision. You just can't pick and choose what laws you want to live under. We don't live. So stop referring. Stop referring to Exodus, Deuteronomy, and Leviticus to beat people up with the word. Yeah, I spoke against Zodiacs, but you didn't see me pull no scripture from no Levitical law because we're no longer under the law. They were all in my inbox. Yes, it do. It, it, yo, you didn't, you didn't say it was a sin, but right here in Deuteronomy, it says something. I was like, bro, you can't use that. One young, one young lady, I said, uh... I said, that's old covenant. She was like, what you mean is old covenant? She said, a whole Bible of covenant. (sighs) 
no shame, but I'm just saying like the only way, the only reason why we're so familiar with the Levitical laws mm -hmm. is because we've been studying it. We've been studying the Levitical law. So we know the law of Moses more than we know Jesus. That's the problem. See, I spoke against Zodiac signs. I don't believe in, in the Zodiac signs. But if I just show you where scripture says that Zodiac signs is a sin, that's not going to stop you from doing it. My responsibility is to explain to you why God is offended by Zodiac signs. So I'm telling you why. I'm not just showing you the scripture. The scripture is not really going to do nothing. Like explain to me why God is against Zodiac signs. I said, because God is your creator. God designed you. God made you. So therefore, God is going to tell you how you're supposed to act. You don't have to look at the sun, the moons, and the stars. You don't have to look at that. Go to him. The reason why you keep getting tricked, because you think you know people through zodiac signs, and you don't. You got the Holy Spirit that'll tell you whether this person is genuine or whether this person is fake. So don't, dip, so don't depend on Virgos. Don't depend on Cancer. Don't depend on whether or not they're a Capricorn. Sweetie, dude, my boy, my girl. You got access to a spirit that'll tell you whether he fouled or not. So it don't matter what his zodiac sign is. So focus on getting a relationship with God and you'll stop getting tricked by the zodiac. So now that gives them more of an idea. Okay, that makes sense, Reggie. So I, I'm not going to the scripture to try to beat somebody or condemn people about zodiac signs. We got to get to where we can explain to these people, to the people who don't know church, who don't know God. And another individual sent me something and said that, uh, she was like, oh, that's divination and that's witchcraft. You speaking over people's head now. The dope boy don't know what witchcraft is. He don't know what divination is. I understand that because I grew up in the church. But we have to get to the point where we can verbalize and teach the Bible and teach Jesus to people, whether they are believers or non-believers. Using these big terms is not, is not really equipping the kingdom with what's needed in order to save the lost. You got to break it down. Witchcraft, divination, that's not going to stop me from identifying with my Zodiac. I'm sorry. You got to come with more. So we got to get to the point. Where we can just stop going to the scripture. To we Google the scripture, copy and paste it, and send it to one, send it to someone, and think that's, that that's going to change their heart, and it's not. Because you sending it more than likely, if you're coming from Leviticus, Deuteronomy, or Exodus, you probably sending it to condemn them, not to show them Jesus. Right, Candace. That's why God spoke. That's why Jesus spoke in parables. But we go Google something, send it to someone because we want to be right instead of taking the time out to explain to the people like this is where you can be in error. If you identify with the Zodiacs, if you identify with a certain behavior, this is what's going to prevent you from hearing from God. See, we too focused on sin. What's a sin? What's not a sin? God addresses your idolatry before he addresses your sin. I'll say that again. God addresses your idolatry before he addresses your sin. Because something can be an idol and it not be bad. But just because it's bad, you don't feel like you need to give it up. No, God says, okay, you shopping all the time. That's not a sin, but you worshiping get more than you worshiping me. Okay, Reggie, you're going to hoop five to six hours a day. Hooping is not a sin. No scripture saying playing basketball is a sin. But you idolize it. You worship it more than you worship me. So at that point, basketball is a sin. But if you only see through the, through the, through the lens of sin, you're going to say, oh, it ain't no sin, so it's okay for me to do it. It ain't no sin, so I don't have to change my behavior. 
And that's why we can't hear the voice of God because we're too focused on our sin instead of addressing the idols in our lives. You can't hear God because you got too much stuff speaking louder than him. Basketball, traveling, hanging out, um, playing video games, uh, social media. See, none of that stuff is bad, but it's idolatry because you worship it more than you worship God. So we have to grow up to where we stop focusing on sin and allow the Holy Spirit to address our idols. Mm -hmm. Back to the text, Reggie. Back to the text. So I told you what circumcision was. Circumcision was a sign. Abraham was righteous before his circumcision. Mm -hmm. I was righteous before I got baptized. I was righteous before I spoke in tongues. I'm talking about me. I was righteous before I started taking communion. I was righteous before I started honoring the Sabbath. That's where we have to get. So we're not so dependent on our deeds and our acts in order for us to be viewed as righteous in God's eye. So, so Reggie, Abraham was saved before circumcision. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He was saved before he was circumcised. Matter of fact, Abraham was counted as righteous before God changed his name. See, his name was Abram. But then God changed his name to Abraham. Circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous, even before he was circumcised. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. And Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised, but only if they have the same kind of faith. Abraham had before he was circumcised. Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. Verse 14, Romans 4. If God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. That's more powerful. That's powerful. That's powerful. Verse 15 says, for the law always brings punishment on on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. Now that's what Paul said. The law of Moses, all those different laws that God gave the Israelites, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, that's the old covenant. I'm not going to go back through it, but can we please stop pulling scriptures out of text just to be right, just to beat people up? Because the majority of the time when somebody pull a, a, a law out of Leviticus or Exodus or Deuteronomy, more than likely they're not showing love to another individual. They're trying to show the other individual where they're wrong. I'm going to show you where Zodiac is a sin. I'll show you where you need to honor the Sabbath. I'll show you where you don't need to eat this type of food. I'll show you where you need to be baptized. That's not how you're going to get people saved by showing them where they are wrong. That's not. If you're going to show them where they are wrong, make sure you end it with love. Make sure you end it with Jesus. Verse 16, so the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. 
and we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scripture means when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and cre who creates new and who creates new things out of nothing. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God has said to him, that's how my that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. Sarah is his wife. Can I ask y'all something? Can I ask y'all something? And you don't have to type it in the comments. But where, what area in your life have you lost hope? What area in your life have you lost hope? Yeah. Could be relationship. It could be career. It could be the idea of having a child. Have you lost hope in those areas? How do you know that you've lost hope? You don't talk about it no more. You don't even talk about it. And if you're talking about it, you're talking about it in a negative way. Like you don't even want it no more. Oh, I don't even want to be married no more. I'm good. I'm good being single. You, if you're talking like that, that means that you've lost hope. You're a certain age, so, so you're thinking it's impossible for God to send you a good man or send you a wife. You may be a single mother. And I know social media says, okay, you don't know man want you, but I'm telling you, be like Abraham. Abraham still had hope. Even though he was 99, he still had a son. What area in your life have you lost hope? When you have lost hope, and I know some of us are righteous and say, oh no, I'm hopeful. I'm telling you, like even I, sometimes I, I lose hope, but I'm telling you. Word of advice, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Watch what you say. I know the conditions say one thing, but you, you better stop talking like that. I'm telling you, stop talking hopeless. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. So the more you talk negative, the more you talk that hopeless talk, you're hearing it. You're planting seeds of hopelessness in your mind because you keep saying the wrong stuff. I don't need a man. I don't want a man. I don't want to get married no more. I don't want to have kids. I don't even care about this career that I that God is. I don't even care no more. I don't want it. I'm good. I don't need nobody. I'm my own boss. I can do it. Just me and my kids. No, stop. Stop talking like that and stop posting like that. Because you're planting seeds of unbelief in your ear. I'm telling you from experience. God has showed me some stuff. And when it didn't come to pass. I was like man I'm good. I don't even care no more. I'm straight. I don't even want to be. I don't even. I don't even want to. I don't even want that promotion. I don't even want that wife. I don't even want that car. I don't even want that house. See, I was talking wrong because I had lost hope. The word says, hope deferred make it the heart sick. So you're speaking wrong because your heart is sick. Yeah, it hurts to hope for things that you don't see coming to pass. Let me tell you something. God appeared to Abraham when he was 75, promised to give him a son. It wasn't until he was 99 that the promise came to pass. That was 24 years.
and I'm not saying that to discourage you. I'm not saying that it's going to be 24 years before you get the promise that God is showing you. I'm just saying like nothing is impossible for God. Yeah, you're a certain age. Okay, that's cool. And statistics says you can't have a, a child after age 40 something. But the word of the Lord, you serve a God who don't care nothing about no statistics. Statistics say if you a single mom and you got more than one kid, the likelihood of you finding a godly man is not very likely. That's what statistics say. But the Lord says, God, God don't care nothing about the statistics. The doctor report says, okay, you can't have kids anymore. The doctor's report say, hey, you got cancer. The doctor's report says, hey, you got a hernia. The doctor's report said, yes, you're diabetic. You got hypertension. Stop repeating what the doctor say. You get your little butt over here, get in this word and see what God says about your situation. And then you start saying what the Lord has said. Don't say what the doctor report says. Don't say what the statistics say. Don't say what social media says. You bring your little butt over here and you get the word of the Lord and you start reciting that every single day. I know it look bad. I know it look not good. I know it look like it's not going to happen. But I'm telling you, I'm, tell, I'm, I'm telling you from experience, you got to start talking right. You got to start talking right. You got to start posting right. Stop reposting stuff where people's hearts sick. We taking advice from individuals. Let me let me put this. Let me let me let me let me break it down. Do you know the majority of the United States? Not only do we live in a pagan nation, we live in a hopeless hopeless nation. No individual has hope. A lot of us don't have any hope. We don't have nothing to look forward to. That's why we can drink anything, eat anything, post anything, sleep with anybody. We don't have nothing to look forward to. Yet we're taking advice from people who have no hope and you're reposting it. Baby, their heart is sick and you're reposting it. Their heart is sick and you're reposting it because it sounds like wisdom, but it's brokenness. I don't need a man. Brokenness. What you bring to the table? Brokenness. That's brokenness and you keep reposting this stuff and listening to it and God saying, that ain't what, I, that ain't, that don't even sound like my word. That don't sound like my word. Why are you repeating it? Because they posted it on TikTok, God, and it sounded good. <laughs> you sharing it with other folks, so you making them feel hopeless. We got to start speaking life. And but just because the beat, the beat hidden, don't mean you need to repost it. I see a lot of us post stuff that comes from a sick heart. But the word says in Romans 4, 18, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. This dude, 99, about to have a son, but he believed God. But let me tell you what happened between those, those 24 years, 24 to 25 years where Abraham was waiting on the promise. See, this is how loving our God is. God was still giving Abraham miracles in certain areas of his life that didn't involve the promised son. Also, God was reminding Abraham. He just didn't have Abraham. He just didn't say it one time and then let Abraham wait for 25 years. No, God will continuously remind you. Remember what I told you? Remember what I showed you? So, okay, Abraham, the word says Abraham didn't lose hope, but I'll throw this in there. Abraham slept with his maidservant, Hagar, because he got tired of waiting on God. What I'm telling you is when you get tired of waiting on God, do not sleep 
with Hagar because you think God moving too slow. A lot of times we jump into relationships because we want to sleep with Hagar. Let me break it down. Abraham was old. His wife was Sarah. They could not have kids, but because they got impatient, Sarah told Abraham to go sleep with Hagar. That's how you're going to have a son. I'm telling you, do not sleep with Hagar. Some of you in a relationship with a Hagar. <laughs> Some of you married a Hagar. Because you, didn't want, you did not want to wait on the Lord. Please wait. I'm telling you. Do not sleep with Hagar. It's going to make your life worse. Because just because, because Abraham slept with Hagar, his whole household was messed up. <laughs> like, whole household messed up. How, how messed up was it, Reggie? It was so messed up, Abraham had to put Hagar and his son out. Just imagine you got to put your own son out. Because you didn't wait. Don't sleep with Hagar. I'm about to wrap this up. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years old, he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. Romans 4.20. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit to assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him. The one who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was handed over to die because of our sins. And he was raised to life. To make us right with God. So out of the stuff that Abraham did. if I want y'all to read the story of Abraham. And I want to let you know. That Abraham during this wait. For the promise. Abraham was not. Was not perfect. Abraham was not perfect. God appeared to Abraham in Genesis 12 and gave him a promise and said, Hey, my boy, leave your hometown. Go over here. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to look out for you. He did that in Genesis 12, right? Genesis 12, 10, Abraham lied. God appeared to you at the beginning of Genesis 12. You mean to tell me 10 verses over? You go lie? Oh, that's a sin. That's a sin, Abraham. You ain't saved. Let me, let me read Genesis 12, 10. At that time, a severe famine struck the land of Canaan, forcing Abram to go to Egypt, where he lived as a foreigner. As he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abram said to his wife, Sarah, look, you are a beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Let's kill him. Then we can have her. So please tell them you are my sister. Then they will spare my life and treat me well because of their interest in you. Abraham lied. Bro, I thought you were supposed to be saved. Abraham, you ain't saved, my boy, because you just lied. That's how, that's how when we focus on sin, that's how we talk. So Abraham lied right after God appeared to him. He also did this. Genesis 16, 1 through 4. I told you he slept with his side chick. He slept with his maidservant. He slept with the Egyptian. That's in Genesis 16. So, if his good, and, I, and I'm going to close. If you have any questions, put them in the comments. So, I leave you with this. 
So if Abraham's good deeds didn't make him righteous, only his faith. Did his bad deeds make him unrighteous? I'll repeat that. If Abraham's good deeds didn't make him righteous, only his faith made him righteous. Did his bad deeds make him unrighteous? So why do you keep beating yourself up? No, not Abraham. I'm, I'm talking to you. Why do you keep beating yourself up because you're not perfect? Why? Your bad deeds don't make you unrighteous. So many Christians, so many Christians run away from God because they're not perfect. So many Christians think they got to get themselves right before they give their life to God. But let me, let me put you on game. Let me tell you a secret. You can't get yourself right. You can't. You can't get yourself right. That's equivalent to you flossing, brushing your teeth, listerining before you go to the dentist. Bro, you can't fix your teeth. Only the dentist can fix your teeth. If you could fix your teeth, you wouldn't need to go to the dentist. <laughs> We're guilty. We go to the dentist. We just we get the little Listerine. That, that still ain't going to fix you. you. You still got them cavities. It's the same thing with God. You can't get yourself right. God is like a dentist. You can't fix your teeth. So you may as well just eat the little chips, the little turkey sandwich, uh, eat all the little Skittles and nine ladies you want to, and just go on to the dentist and say, hey, my boy, go ahead and do your thing because I can't, I can't fix this cavity. It's, all, it's, already, it's already done. <laughs> we can't get us right. We can't. We can't get us right. I tried so long to get myself right. And I did for a little while. No cap. I did for a little while. I got myself right for a little while. I wasn't drinking. I wasn't sexing. I wasn't clubbing. I wasn't doing nothing. But then I got tired. Then I got exhausted. Then I got triggered. And then life hit me with a left hook. Boom. And then I went right back to what I was doing. I got exhausted. Why? Because I was trying to get myself right. You can't get yourself right. Only Jesus can. Your righteousness is in Jesus. Your belief in Jesus, not by you fasting 24 hours a day, not by you doing communion, not by circumcision, not by baptism, not by you joining the church, not by you doing none of that. Your righteousness, righteousness, Right standing with God is only through faith and your belief in Jesus Christ. I know that's too good to be true. I know they didn't teach you that. But I'm telling you, Paul telling you, Abraham telling you, the Holy Spirit is telling you that you're righteous. You, God look at you as righteous just because you believe in him. Point blank period. Now I was all over the place tonight. It's all good. I hope y'all got it. Holy Spirit, I hope you interpreted that for them. Um, any questions? Kenya, do you have anything you want to say? Now, let me tell y'all this. If we, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn or nothing, but if we started spreading the good news to this extent, we wouldn't have so many people hating, hating Jesus, hating God. The reason why people hate God is because we're talking about sin too much. We're trying to find reasons to send them to, send them to hell instead of finding reasons to send them to heaven. How do we surrender 
to God wholeheartedly. How do we surrender to God wholeheartedly? I don't know. Is is a, I don't think is a certain behavior is a certain heart posture. Um, a heart a heart posture where you're totally throwing yourself into God completely. What does that look like? Um, a, a sense of desperation. Um, when you're desperate for something, when you're thirsty for something, your mind always stays on that particular thing. You lay down with it. You wake up with it. It's on your mind on your lunch break. It's on your mind while you're at work. Like you unplug from things that distract you from being focused on that particular thing. It's the same thing with God. When you're desperate for God. Like you're going to look crazy. People are going to tell you it don't take all that. When I totally surrender to God. I invited the Holy Spirit in. And I prayed to God. Whatever's in my life, whatever's in my life, whatever, whatever in my life is preventing me from seeing and hearing you, take it away. Take it away, whatever it is, God. And God is going to start to point out things in your life that's not like him. And he's going to ask you to put them on the altar. Put them on the altar. I mean everything, your house, your car, your job, your marriage, whatever it is, God, whatever it is, take it away. Now, some of the stuff he's going to take away. Other things you're going to have to lay on the altar. And some one of the main things that we're going to have to lay on the altar is your time. You got to give more time to God, more time in his word. More time seeking him, more time praying, more time just saturated in his presence. Sometimes I used to come home and I'm not getting on social media and I'm not turning the TV on. I'm in the word the entire evening. Why? Because my heart was so broken. I'm like, man, I really need to hear from God. And I did that for a long time. People used to look at me crazy, but that's how broken I was and I was desperate for God. And I didn't realize by me consistently doing that, God was transforming me. But it didn't make sense to nobody else. And if you diligently seek the Lord, you'll see he start to change your diet. He'll start to change your, 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 your habits. He'll start to speak to you. He'll start revealing himself to you. And now the desperation increases. The thirst increases. The hunger increases. The word says those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Ooh, that's a lengthy way to put it. I hope I answered your question. If not, hit me up in my inbox. Do you make your, do you make an altar at home? Is it just a certain place you meet God or if it's a physical place, that's a very good question, Miss Keisha. Starting off, I had an altar at my house. And my altar was my closet. I would sleep in my closet. Um, when I say sleep, I'm not saying sleep in there all day. I'm saying when I would normally go to bed, instead of sleeping in my bed, I would sleep in my closet. I would do that for six nights, six to seven nights in a row. That's desperate. Like I really need to hear God. I did that consistently for duration, durations um, during my journey. I don't do it now. Um, and then I went from my closet and then I had a round table in my dining room where I would sit with God and write down things, uh, read my Bible. In that at that dining room table was where I first spoke in tongues on December 24, 2017. Then it transitioned into one of my bedrooms. So it went from my closet to the dining room table to one of my bedrooms. 
Then God said, Reggie, I, I have made your I have made your heart an altar. Your heart becomes an altar. Now you don't have to meet me at those places. I'm with you all the time now. Because I've allowed my spirit to be so dominant in your life. Now your heart is an altar. What I mean when I say that, I can quote a scripture or replay the scriptures in my head without even opening a Bible. I don't have to do this all day. I don't want y'all to think I'm like this all day. Oh, Reggie, stay in his word. There was a season where I was just like this all the time. Lunch break. At church. After I got off work. When I woke up in the morning. But the word became so branded on my heart to where I'm going down the road now and scriptures running through my head. I'm watching a basketball game. Scriptures running through my head. I'm watching DC Young Fly on Breakfast Club and scriptures running through my head. Because I've saturated, I've allowed myself to be saturated in the word, saturated in the spirit. So now I've become that and I don't have to sit in the closet, sleep in the closet. I don't have to sit at the dining room table. I don't have to go to that bedroom because God said, I'm with you all the time. Now I have made your heart an altar. So starting off, yeah, I made a physical altar. Wherever it is, it could be in your bathroom. It could be in your car where you meet God, but don't get stuck there. Don't get stuck there because I think churchianity teaches us to get stuck. So the only time God, so the only time most people, some people meet God is at church. No, you got to, you got to get beyond that to where what you experienced at church. You can take to your bedroom, to your car, to your shower. But because we get stuck, we, we experience arrested development. We keep God at church and God don't want that. God wants to be with us 24 seven. Well, wherever we are, and he wants to be within us. Does that make sense? But I would encourage you to make a physical, a physical altar for the simple fact that's an act of faith. Yeah. Say, God, I'm going to designate this part of my house just for you. You're going to meet God right there. God going to start to speak. And then he may go quiet. That means he wants you to move. Move to another area. God, I'm going to designate this spot specifically for you. And then your heart becomes like that. Any more questions? Those are very good questions. Thanks, Savannah. Kenya, did you have anything? I know it's too good to be true. I know it's too good to be true for God to look at you as being right with him, even though you still slip up, even though you still smoke, even though you still curse, even though you still sexing, even though you still popping pills, even though you tatted up, you still righteous. If you believe in Jesus Christ, I didn't say it. The word said, it. oh, do it again. Can you my bad? You still I didn't see it, me, me, me. I didn't see your question. Can you? There she go. No, I didn't see your question, me, Hey, y'all. What up, Kenya? What's going on? I just wanted to um, join you in the fact that many of us get stuck at our latest disappointment. It may be a woman who is constantly getting negative pregnancy tests when she's praying for a God, for a baby. It may be, you know, you've been looking for a particular job or a particular promotion and you keep being looked over. And a lot of us walk away from God during those greatest disappointments because it teaches us that, oh, God doesn't care about me or God doesn't love me or God doesn't see me as worthy. But I would encourage all of us when we go through those seasons of tests, trials and disappointments, 
that's when we have to draw ourselves closer to God. You got to be willing to bring that thing that hurt you the most, that failed relationship, that miscarriage, uh, that divorce. We got to be willing to bring those hurtful things and place it back into the hands of God because God will give us clarity on the season that we're in. A lot of times those things that you are going through hurt you because it's not time yet or because God wants to refine you or God wants to do a little bit more preparation in you. But I realize those are the times that we walk away and we get give up on our faith and we give up completely and we rely just on being a good enough person. And yeah, it doesn't make you not saved. But you may be missing the promises of God because you've let it go. You've released it simply because it wasn't God's timing. One thousand percent. A lot of times we pray. We pray for things, but then we don't want to go through the process that comes with God actually answering the prayer. Uh, a lot of times when heaven opens on your behalf god comes in and interrupts whatever you're like god is an interrupter jesus is an interrupter so you got caught in this routine but then you lose your job or you go through a divorce or the relationship goes left that's god answering your prayer but because like kenya said we walk away from god during those times of perceived disappointment God's like, that's me answering your prayer, bro. Like you said, you want to be stronger. You said you want to be more spiritual. So let me put my hand on you. And that don't feel good. When God places his hand on you, sometimes it don't feel good. But that's him answering your prayer. So you have to sustain and weather the storms and disappointments to start. You, we need to start perceiving it correctly. See, a lot of times we think that God is punishing us or it's disappointment. Why don't we say, OK, that's God answering my prayer because he did it with Abraham. He did it with Reggie. He did it with Kenya. So this is not punishment. This is not disappointment. This is God answering my prayer. And although it don't feel good. It's him. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, most of the time. Um, what we're through it's gonna be painful um and we can expect we can expect pain when we when you really when you really following god for real when you really all tuned in that refinement hurts it, it refinement is not comfortable you can expect the struggle i'm looking for your uh your uh miss mimi i'm looking i'm for looking for go ahead mimi. okay you got it um you can expect that struggle repost, you can, repost it mimi you can um anticipate that you're gonna go through some pain when you living for god for real but it's a refinement is is we all gonna be put through the fire and it's sometimes it's when you least expect it and sometimes it's when it rains it pours yeah it's it's we live in a culture where we want it quick we want it quick, um, not to throw shade on on any on women, but the BBL is an announcement that okay, I want it quick. I don't want to go through the process. You get what I'm saying? Some of the men have different body alterations that announces, okay, I want it quick. I don't want to go through the process. And because we've been conditioned to be like that when it comes to God. When it don't come quick, we tap out. But as Abraham waited 25 years for the promise, waited 25 years. And a lot of times God has to mature us and take us through a process because if he were to give you what you wanted right now, he'll it'll crush you. Certain things in my life right now, I was just thinking the other night. Had God given it to me when I first asked for it, I would have been jacked up. I would have been jacked up. Sometimes we're praying for things, but we don't want to grow up. And the fact that we don't want to grow up is the reason why God can't give it to us. 
we become arrogant and think we're already ready to be married. We're already ready to be parents. We're already ready to be the CEO. But God is saying, okay, you think you are, but I know that you aren't because I'm looking at your heart. And if your heart is not right within me, you're not ready to handle what you're praying for because it will destroy you. It will crush you. So I can't give it to you right now. I, I didn't want it to echo, but I'm over here, amen, in everything you said. Uh, I was having a conversation the other day, and it occurred to me why God didn't do what I was asking God to do. Like, for me, in this season, I'm struggling with time management. It just seems like it's not enough hours in a day to get everything done, to get all my work done, to get my prayer time and studying time done, and take care of everything I need to take care of. And God is like, but you're asking me for more. How do you expect me to enlarge your territory? How do you expect me to enlarge your ministry and give you more to do when you can't manage the 24 hours that you have right now? And at first I was like, all right, God, I'm going to just, just cut something out. <laughs> I'm going to quit something. And God is like, no, you need to learn how to be more disciplined with your time in order for me to bless you with more. You need to learn how to better manage it. God ate me up. And I was like, oh, okay, that's why I'm not growing in this area because I haven't learned how to steward, be a good steward of what he's already given me. That part. So what you do? So what you're saying is God was direct with you. Like God didn't really sugarcoat it. He told you like it was. And that didn't feel good. Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. And and uh, even even small things like like you want a family, you want this, you're not, you not doing what you need to do to take care of yourself. How you expect to be able to take care of a husband, a household, and some children? You say you're going to work up at, at work out at 3 o'clock in the morning and it's not 3.30 and you oversleeping. <laughs> nah, ma'am. No, you're not disciplined enough for a husband. You're not disciplined enough to have children. You're not a Proverbs 31 woman, ma'am. Not yet. You ain't got it yet. That's how God talked to me. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but that's how God talks to me. Hold on. Say that. Oh, no, you can't jump off. No, you can't say that last <laughs> little part of it. Not, not Dr. Kenya. Not Dr. Kenya Chanel that's <laughs> attractive, don't have no kids. Bossed up, all that. Now say that last part one more time. Hold God show, God show me. <laughs> Don't you better not scream. Don't nobody scream record nothing. No, I know this gonna be on YouTube, but do not scream record it. <laughs> but yeah, God told me I'm not ready yet, and that's that's the thing. I've accomplished so much that I almost believe that I can do anything, right? But that's the enemy. And that's pride and that's arrogance. I can't do anything. I'm finding in this season, I'm way more weary now than I was when I was going through my PhD program. And it's because in my PhD program, I stayed on my knees. But when I graduated, I'm like, oh, I got this. I'm good. I know what I'm doing. I can handle it. And God showed me when I stopped relying on him, immediately started lacking immediately started falling off and so i'm thinking oh yeah i'm i'm the proverbs 31 type of woman you know i got this degree i have a career i'm in ministry blah blah blah, blah, blah. and god is saying no you're not you're not ready to be a wife you can't even do what you said you was going to do you don't stick to it you don't stick to your diet you don't stick to your workout you don't stick to nothing you ain't stuck to nothing since you got that degree you ain't ready you ain't ready. We lack, di I, Kenya, Dr. Kenya Chanel, whatever you want to call it, I lack discipline. And God is like, no, you got to grow. Because where I'm calling you to, where I want, what I want to bless you with is going to require the utmost discipline. You have no choice but to rely on me and stay in my face and be present at every moment. Because if not, you're going to drop the ball. You're going to ruin it. You're going to ruin it if I do it for you now. I got to grow up, bro. I'm over here laughing because you got in trouble with God. See, that's why I don't be telling you nothing. See how you do? See, y'all y'all see how you do me? 
Y'all don't eat. <laughs> Ken, you got in trouble. You got a whooping. I told you. Nah, but for real. No cap, man. Like when you have a relationship with God, he go tell you about yourself. I promise you on everything. I knew I was a strong eight. I'm like, man, I take care of myself. I got buys, tries, and a six pack. I got two cars. I got a house. I'm well spoken. I got good conversation. I'm financially stable. So I went to God in my arrogance, talking about God. I'm already a husband. Where my wife at? When God stripped me down and pulled that mirror up and showed me me, I was on two. A two. So when I see individuals who are arrogant, I'm like, you, you ain't met God, have you? You go to church, but you ain't met God because God going to tell you about yourself. I'm talking about like for real. And he's going to shoot you straight. He's not going to say, hey, Miss Kenya. Hey, Dr. Kenya, I just wanted to tell you that um, there's certain areas of your life that I really need to, uh, as of right now, I really need to see uh, some improvement. So I'm going to put you on an uh, improvement plan and we're going to see how you do for the next 90 days. And uh, do we talk like that, Kenya? I need for you to get back on here. No, God don't be sweet to me no more. And and, <laughs> and I'm the t I've always been the type of daughter, even with my daddy. Like if he raised my voice, I'm gonna be a puddle. If he raises his voice, I'm gonna be a puddle of water. Like I cannot take it. And God be yelling at me, and I just be like, God, why are you speaking so loud? Just be sweet. Like speak quietly. And God is like, no, because I've been telling you the same thing over and over and over and over again. And you think you got time? No, do it right now. When I wake you up in the middle of the night, get up right now. No, you can't sleep five more minutes. Now. Now, can you? And see, I don't like to be fussed at. God be fussing at me, so. Mm. So God is God is really equipping you with what's needed for what you're praying for. Um, God sounds like a man or a or, or a masculine, a divinely masculine man sounds like god um so sometimes the delivery from god may not be all soothing sweet and ram rainbows and four leaf clovers like he's direct i mean he talked to me like that because that's that's what men do but if you haven't spent time with god and then you think that you're a wife and when your husband or your wife wants you to do something at that moment, you automatically get in your feelings or become offended. That shows me you hadn't spent time with God because he gonna tell you to do some stuff that's offensive. I mean, that may offend you. So it don't matter what your delivery is with me. Like if you telling me the truth, if you're instructing me to do something, I'm gonna do it. I don't care what your delivery is. Um, but uh, Kenya, I appreciate that transparency. Um, I think that was much needed. Yeah, you got some more you wanna say? I'm gonna just say this last thing. Um, be careful and seek God for yourself because a lot of us will mimic our community We'll look at we'll look at this person and be like, oh, God is moving this way in this person's life. So I'm gonna try to mimic the same thing. No, 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 no. God is powerful enough to give you specific instructions. You just got to get in his face and stay in his face and wait for him to speak. God will speak to you. So don't don't try to do what sis over here doing because you see her spiritual life growing and you see god doing particular things sis over here done quit her job six months ago and so you think now you need to quit your job because sis's ministry is elevating because now she's availing herself to god in a different way but god still wants you to stay on your job so you can be a manifestation of a shifting in the atmosphere god may want you to minister to a few more people on that job before he calls you to move but if you move out of season and move out of timing just because you what you see god doing in other people's lives you're gonna miss they're gonna miss their blessing because you're out of position no move when god tells you to move. move how god tells you to move a lot of us want the easy way out 
Like, I ain't gonna lie to y'all. I'm begging God to take me out of my career so I could do ministry full time. And God is like, I know. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And I just want to move. I want to move. I want to quit. God, I want to wake up with the sun and I want to get up and be in my word and have study time. And God is like, nope, I still, you're still on assignment. And so you can't quit when it gets rough. You can't quit when you get tired. Endure. This is an endurance season. Keep pressing. That's it. That's all. <laughs> it sounds like I, I stay on. I don't think it, if it starts to echo and then we, you can you can mute. Okay. Um, but I think like it seems like to me like God is stripping you of your. It's like God is asking you to put your emotions on the altar. <sighs> Like he don't like he don't want to make decisions from your emotions. So yeah, you don't you won't sleep in five minutes? No, get up. Cause you not I mean, it seems just told me tonight, it seems as if God is is molding you to move by the spirit instead of your feelings, instead of your emotions. Absolutely. Because that's how you walk, that's how that's how you've been your majority of your life, right? Yeah, yeah, and and a lot and a lot of times in the past, I mean, I'm an empathic person just naturally, and so I think that whatever I feel, that's the way to go, and God is allowing me to be more discerning now, and like, no, it's not a feeling, it's an ushering and an uttering by the Holy Spirit. You gotta trust the Spirit, so because feelings are finicky, especially with me. <laughs> You can't trust your feelings. You can't trust your heart. You got to go by the spirit. And so just I'm a quote unquote natural empath. And before I defined myself by that and I've identified myself by that, then I think that's the way to go. And God is stripping me of all of that. God is like, I don't care nothing about how you feel. So what? You don't feel like it. So what? You tired today. So what you feel burdened, still go pray. I need you to go pray for these 13 people. Go pray for them. Can you? God, I don't want to. God is like, I don't care. Go anywhere. And then I walk <laughs> into the patient room and I pray and the Holy Spirit falls. Got to be more careful. Lord's doing a work. And even if I'm the vessel, I got to position myself to be used no matter what I'm going through and no matter what I feel like. It's going to be plenty of days I don't want to preach. It's going to be plenty of days I don't want to pray. It's going to be plenty of days I don't want to prophesy and lay hands. Do it anyway. God didn't care about how Jesus felt when he was on the cross. Get it done, my boy. Get it done. I know this is painful, but get it done. Because everybody here and everybody to come is relying on you. There is somebody relying on you, Kenya Chanel. That person in that that person in that patient room, she relying on you. He relying on you. Somebody needs you to go pray for that baby that's about to die in the NICU. They relying on you. Not that you're ushering in the power of God. Is God doing it through you? But you got to be in the right position. And sometimes it's gonna hurt. Sometimes your feelings gonna be hurt. Sometimes you're gonna be tired, weary, and frustrated. Do it anyway. When we say that we want to be used of God, it's not all glitz and glamorous and wonderful and perfect. And even when it don't work out the way that you thought that it would, still keep getting up and going back and doing what God is telling you to do anyway. Mm. You just spoke a whole word right there. So you mean to tell me, Kenya, you doing all this? God. So you ain't been on the right man show. That's what you tell me. <laughs> I don't have time to wait on no husband. <laughs> and I'm not I'm not saying that to be arrogant. I'm saying that like 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 our time is fading swiftly. I don't I don't have time to wait on a covering. I don't have time to wait on somebody who's gonna pray for me and build me up and hold my hand. I ain't got to, I gotta do my work because I want God to be well pleased when I get to heaven. I don't have time. So either this husband is gonna come along and get in line with God wants him to, or he not, but I gotta do my work anyway. So these are these are things that you're practicing now that you're while you're single. Yeah. So then when you get into ministry, when you get into a marriage, when you get into parenthood, you've already conditioned yourself to operate like 
unselfishly. Mm. And that's mm. the part of the process that we sometimes leave out. We think that we can acquire these things that you are acquiring now when the right person shows up. That's not how God designed it. God wants him. God shows up and then shows us how to be that minister, how to be that prophet, how to be that wife, that husband, so on and so forth. But you manage of your singleness instead of just waiting. Yeah. You sound like you uh this uh, this is what it this this is what it feels like. This is what it is when you take advantage of being single. Like these are conversations that you're having with God that you probably couldn't have if someone else was in the picture. Mm. God is being selfish with you right now. Once he gets you to where you need to be, he'll go, he'll say, okay, now, now, now it's time for you to be a wife. Now it's time for you to be a parent. Now it's time for you to do ministry. Now it's time for you to leave your job. But right now, God being selfish with you. And I think we skipped this part to where, um, man, I'm so, I'm so appreciative of your transparency. See, people aren't going to read uh, Genesis 12. They go look at your testimony that you just gave us, which was way better than anything that I spoke on tonight. People need to see our transparency, our experience with experiences and, and walk with God, which gives them hope. But when we closed off, don't want to share our story, don't want to have a relationship with God, people are hopeless. But I um man, that was so good. Your 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 testimony and the process that you're going through. Dang, that was a lot. I can just repost that. You can. I'm gonna send you the clip so you.